grateful that you are on our sermon website. You're about ready to witness the message that we just preached this morning. Uh, feel free to share it with friends, uh, play it over and over. If you have any questions, you can go on our email a site and share uh, with us questions or thoughts that you might have concerning the church or the message. But we hope that you'll enjoy it and that it will challenge you and encourage you today. Hey, good morning. Welcome to worship with us at Kissimmee Christian Church. We're so glad that you tuned in and that you're a part of what we're doing here today. Hey, if you go to Titus chapter 3, you find some words, this, this operative image that kicks us into worship today. And it's just like this, right? That in the midst of COVID anxiety, in the midst of homebound restlessness, we have a living hope. Right? That's our reminder today. And that's what we get to sing about. That's what we get to celebrate that we have a living hope, right? So why don't you join us as we sing to the one who gives us that hope together. Join us today.
we just say to you today that you are our way maker, promise keeper, miracle worker. And God, we acknowledge that in this place today. In all of our spaces today, all of our living rooms. God, we acknowledge that truth about you. God, you are our living hope. God, you have given us hope. You're the, the rock that we build our lives on. And God, it's just our prayer that you would be increasingly glorified, that you would be the center of everything that we're going through, that you would be the stable place that we can reach out to. Be our way maker today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So glad that you are with us this morning, worshiping with us in your home or on your computer. We say this all the time, but even though we can't be here collectively, and, and Rory uh, brought this to our attention, uh, that we are able to worship God uh, in so many different ways. And we've learned how to get real creative, haven't we, over the last couple of months during this quarantine. But I got some great news. I have got some great news. We are regathering next week. A week from today, we are regathering. And let me just share with you some real pertinent information. There's just way too much questions to answer during our message. We have compiled almost two and a half pages of questions and answers regarding the regathering service starting next week, May 31st. So what I want you to do is after the service today, after the program, I want you to go to our website, KissimmeeChristianChurch.org, KissimmeeChristianChurch.org, Google Kissimmee Christian Church. Even a monkey can do this, so everybody, it ain't that hard. Google that, and then I want you to go to the events calendar, the events page. And on the events page, you will see what the regathering process looks like. Now, we're not calling it reopen, because the church never closed. Uh, this church has been so active, even during this quarantine. Our Christian school has not missed a beat, although we've been educating children via Zoom. And we had a huge, huge farewell end of the year event Friday afternoon was fantastic, so I just want to remind all of our parents, you're invited to come back to worship with us. But May 31st, a week from today, we are regathering. It's called the regathering process. Now, there's a lot going on, and we need you to pay careful attention to the information. But I'm just going to give you a few pointers right now. There are four services that will be offered, one at 815. Now, we're encouraging folks who are primarily, uh, well, 65 and older, whose immune system may be slightly compromised, who are a little nervous about getting out amongst a lot of people to come to the 815 service, which as of right now will be taking place in the fellowship hall, okay, 815. There will be the 930, there will be the 11, and then at 5 o'clock, not 530, there will be the fourth service. Now, the fourth service, the 5 o'clock, will be the same style of music, the same message as the 9, 30, and 11. We're trying our best to take the pressure off the 9, 30, and 11 by adding the 8, 15, which will be a traditional service, traditional service in the fellowship hall. The 5 o'clock will be very much the same as what you hear at the 9, 30, and 11. Now, here's the key. We need you to register. All right? Now, this isn't for the government. Cause someone asked me a question. Is this for the government? Absolutely not. All right? you, you, you know me well enough to know that. That ain't going to happen. This is so we will know how many are coming uh, so we can let you know on the events page or through Facebook and emails and all kinds of information as to, okay, this service is full, now you got to shift to the 11 or you got to shift to the 5. Now, um, you can register online with your family, let us know, and when it's full, we'll tell you because there's only so many we can put in the sanctuary and meet the CDC standards. Uh, we're going to use every other pew, all right, there'll be plenty of space in the pews, uh, for uh, social distancing, which is an oxymoron, because if you're social, you shouldn't be distancing. So I call it people distancing. But the point is, we're taking every precaution. Go on that page and check it out. These beautiful little hand sanitizer machines are located throughout the foyer. So during the service or after the service, you can 
you know, cleanse yourself. Our greeters will be at the door with gloves and masks to make sure we cut down on any type of uh, a possible way of, 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 of sending out viruses or receiving them. The point is, we have gone through a billion hoops to make sure it is going to be safe and enjoyable. And I've said this to our staff, and I'm going to say it to you. We're doing our best to make sure this building, this facility, is cleaner than your house. All right? That's the, that's the effort we're making to make sure when you get back here, you're going to enjoy your experience, and, uh, and we're all going to be able to get back and do what we were intended to do at the beginning of the church, and that's the fellowship. Now, you can read the Bible by yourself. You can take communion alone. You're not encouraged to the New Testament, but you can. Uh, you can watch this service by yourself, but you can't fellowship alone. One of the four ingredients of the healthy church is prayer, breaking of bread, apostles' doctrine, and fellowship. We, we really need to get together. I'm so glad to hear the president even say, look, it's an essential part of a civil society uh, to be able to worship. All right? And so if you're physically sick, you need to go to a doctor. But the church is a spiritual hospital, and people need the opportunities and permission to come back. Mr. President, I appreciate you so very much for saying that. You are spot on. All right, now, let's talk about what it means to be sanitized. Our lives have changed since COVID-19. Our lives have changed. James, the fourth chapter, verse 8 is our key text date. So if you've got your Bible, go ahead and turn to James 4.8. We're going to focus on that verse of Scripture today. James the Apostle, James is the half-brother of Jesus. He is the preacher of Jerusalem. Oh, and by the way, by the way, you know what next week is, right? It's Pentecost Sunday. It's the birthday of the church. What a great opportunity. What a great day to all of us come back and not only celebrate corporate worship again, but hey, we're getting to celebrate the birthday of the church. It is as important that we celebrate Pentecost Sunday as we do the birth of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. Because without the birth, there is no resurrection, and Jesus wouldn't have had to rise again if he had no intention of establishing the church. So next Sunday, and next Sunday, I want you to come prepared to celebrate the birthday of the church because it's, it's Pentecost Sunday. All right, so James says in the fourth chapter, verse 8, here's what I want you to do, church. I want you to wash your hands. I want you to wash your hands. You're like, I had no idea that James was that concerned about hygiene. Well, we're going to in just a few seconds, break down what that really means. But I, I just, I, I set up a bunch of stuff here on our table because these, th these, uh, these artifacts, this material has changed our lives. I remember when uh, you, you went to the hospital, hospital people or people that were cleaning uh, uh, hotel rooms, they're the only people wearing these, these gloves. Now everybody's wearing them now. Everybody's wearing them. Our greeters will have them on as they open the door to keep you from having to touch the door. Uh, you know what? The only people wearing these were surgeons and nurses and a couple people in the airport. Now everybody's wearing them. I, I drove by the other day, and there was a person driving by himself in a car, and he had one on. And I'm thinking, man, you know the virus is bad if you're afraid you're going to give it to yourself. And, but if that's what you got to do, that's fine. But now everybody's wearing these. You go to the store, you wear them. You go out to the to, to the to anywhere, everybody's wearing the mask because it's a part of what we do now. It's a part of our society. How about these hand pumps, hand sanitizers? Everybody's got them. We're always using them. This Clorox, they were wiping down everything. I just came across that article a couple of days ago where they're now saying that maybe the virus doesn't stay alive on the surface as much as we once thought. And by the way, a bunch of news is going to change. Just yesterday, uh, uh, was it Dr. Rachi who said, maybe, maybe this quarantine, this long period of quarantine may not be as good on society as we once thought. I'm like, hello. So uh, news is changing. The way we treat the virus is changing. Lysol, you got like 25, 25 of these now, right, in your home. And you're spraying down everything, right? Everybody, we just use it for deodorant. You know, that's what we do now. Everybody's just spraying it down because, hey, we want to stay sanitized. James 4, 8. James says, James says to us in the fourth chapter, verse 8, wash your hands. Wash your hands. But what does that really mean? What does that really mean? Have you ever just gone into a bathroom and seen this sign? And it just makes you wonder why in the world we would ever have to see this. Why would we have to remind employees after using the bathroom to wash their hands? I mean, this should just 
be a natural. I mean, this should just be an obvious. But we have to now encourage people to do what they should have been doing for years, for years. And so sanitization, good hygiene, it's something we want to do. It's something we should be doing. It's something that, that, we, that is essential for society to stay physically healthy. So if we haven't learned anything from COVID-19, I guarantee after all the pundits and all the, and, uh, the, the people and the commentators and all the narrative is done, here's what they're going to end up with. Ready? If you're sick, stay home. If you're sick, stay home and wash your hands more liberally. That's what we're going to end up with, and we should have been doing it anyway. There's just so much to remember. So James says, look, wash your hands. Wash your hands. But what does that mean? Well, first of all, before he says to wash our hands in James, the fourth chapter, he says you need a really good doctor. You need a really good doctor. And that doctor is the great physician, and his name is God, the great I am, the sovereign one. James 4, 8, draw near to God. Draw near to God. The Greek term, draw near to God, before he even gets to the washing of hands, before he even gets to that, the term draw near to God, it simply means get close to God. Now, you've heard social distancing. We hear it every day, a billion times a day. We hear the word social distance, social distance. Stay as far away from people, wear a mask, wear a glove, wear a hazmat suit, whatever. But do you realize in James, the fourth chapter, the great physician says, listen, in time of quarantine, maybe you got to stay away from people, but there is never a moment in time where you should not be connected with your heavenly Father. The term draw near to God simply means get as close to your heavenly Father as you can. Now, James is advocating here in verse 7 8, draw near to God, first of all, means in order to do that, we have to resist the devil. Now, the devil, and according to Scripture, is the great virus, okay? The devil represents the great bacteria in society. All that is evil, all that is wrong, all that is detrimental to the spiritual development of you and me all resides in the grand virus, the devil. So in order to draw near to God, I have to first recognize who the plague is, what the spiritual virus is, and it's Satan. Guy Woods, a great Church of Christ writer says we come near to God we draw near to God we get close to God when we study his word and I know a lot of folks this is great news it's great news during this time of quarantine where you've kind of withdrawn from society and you've been laid off although that's not good our prayers that our economy can jump start people get back to work but some of you have allowed this opportunity to really get more involved in scripture reading some of you have gotten into some small group and life groups, even though they've been on Zoom, and you've gotten closer to God during this crisis, during this virus, during this pandemic. And that's excellent. So Guy Wood says, you want to draw near to God? It's not just a figure of speech. You do that when you get in His Word. You do that when you worship Him in spirit and in truth, and when you serve Him faithfully. During one of Israel's rare periods in the Old Testament where they were actually faithful where they were actually obedient to God, where they were actually drawing near to God, where they desired to get close to Him. We read these words in Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, verses 5 through 8. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn along, you can, or just follow along on the screen. Here's Moses' words to the children of Israel. I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So you're going to go to a foreign land, a pagan land, and I'm giving you that land. It's known as the promised land, the land of Canaan, 10,000 square miles of choice real estate. But here's what you got to do, contingent on, you've got to keep and do my commandments. For that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near? You know, we talk about, again, social distancing. God never intended for his people to distance themselves from him. And I'm not talking about the fact that we haven't been able to come and worship corporately. I, we've been worshiping him. Many of you have been worshiping him more intently, probably during the crisis and during this quarantine, than before. The reality is, God never intended 
for there ever to be an epidemic, a pandemic, a situation in your life where you withdraw. Last week we spoke of a great prophet of God, Elijah, who was at the top of his game, put 450 prophets of Baal to flight, begin to bring spiritual and political revival into Israel. And during that time of great victory, he ran and hid. Listen, this is not the time for the church to become reclusive. This is not the time of, for God's people to become self-dependent, but rather codependent on the Holy Spirit. And so Moses says, listen, I want you to always draw near to God. For what great nation is there that has a God so near? And he says, you know, the pagans, the pagan nations, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Hittites, and all the other nations surrounding Israel, they worship these false images made of iron and wood and clay. Not you, not you, children of Israel, because you have a God that you can call on. Oh, what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today. United States of America, we are blessed. We are blessed like no other nation on the planet. We are endowed also by our Creator with certain inalienable rights that among these rights are life, liberty, and the ability to pursue happiness. And I say unapologetically to the listening audience and those watching this telecast today, the same thing that gave Israel its identity was their fond respect for Almighty God, a sovereign God who is the source of all truth. And right now, America needs a cleansing. And it's not the kind of cleansing you're going to get with these gloves or a, a mask or this. Or even this. America needs to read Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, and realize, listen, when we draw near to God as a world, as a nation, we get to know God and understand His precepts and we appreciate and respect His statutes, then we will be blessed again. And the plague of sin, the virus that comes with living a carnal, secular life will become distasteful. The desire to honor God will become the order of the day. And so James 4 eight says, draw near to God, a.k.a. get close to God. And then he'll draw near to you. Now the verb here is future. The verb here is future and the promise conditional. Remember that. Draw near to God, then he'll draw near to you. The verb here is future, the promise conditional. Conditional on what? Me inviting God into my life. Me inviting God into my life. Listen, God's a gentleman. He will not force himself on you. You may have an in-law that you can't get rid of. You, you may have a neighbor that's always in your front door. But I'm going to tell you something. God is not going to force himself on you. You say, well, I thought grace was irresistible. Unfortunately, many are resisting it. But when you invite God into your world, when you draw near to God, God says, okay, you've given me permission to get into your world and to clean it up and to remove the sin virus out of your life. I'll do it but I need your invitation. Behold, I stand at the door and what? Beat it down? No, I knock. And if any man will open that door and invite me in, John says in the book of Revelation, I will come in and I will sanitize your heart. I'll clean up your mess. But I need an invitation. And I'm hoping today, as you watch this program, that you'll begin to say, God, I have gone all through all kinds of hoops to keep from getting the coronavirus. I wear a mask everywhere I go. I even wear it to sleep. I'm Cloroxing everything. Every time I go somewhere, I'm double-checking everything. Listen, we're all there, right? We're all more conscious of that. But are you, are you thinking about your heart today? Are you concentrating on your spiritual health? Draw near to God, He'll draw near to you. Isaiah, the 55th chapter, verses 7 and 8, the Messianic prophet says these words, let the wicked forsake his way. Let the wicked understand that he's got a virus. It's called sin, and let remove it from his heart. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts. Oh, we are so conscious right now about making sure we don't breathe on someone or someone doesn't breathe on us. You've probably been somewhere and maybe forgot your mask and everybody looks at you like you got the plague. The reality is, Isaiah says, look, let's, let's think about what's going on up here too. 
Let's think about what's being fostered and generated within our hearts and our minds. And let him return to the Lord. That is, let him repent of his sins and come back to God. And, and God will have compassion on him. Oh, I love the great physician. I love going to a doctor called the Almighty God and says, Jim, I care about your condition. And I want you to get better and I'm going to help you get better. And he will abundantly pardon. I'm talking about a full pardon, a full recovery. You know, we get excited when we hear of people who had the COVID virus and then make full recovery. It excites us, right? Not that they got the virus, but that they're healthy and that they're getting stronger again. And more and more people are. And, and, and more and more medical equipment is available. And we're, we're seeing in some places it's escalating. In other places it's dying down. And that excites us. And we want that. And spiritually speaking, Isaiah says, look, we need to, we need to have an abundant pardon. I need to hear the great physician God say, Jim, your sins have been fully covered. You are not germ-free, but you are now free of the guilt and the hopelessness that came with your sin. Wow, only God can do that. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways, declares the Lord, are not your ways. And then, of course, he gets to the term, wash your hands. And we started off the sermon with this concept of wash your hands. Why We've entitled the sermon, Sanctify and Sanitize. Uh, what in the world does James mean when he says, okay, we talked about draw near to God. We know that once we make that effort, he'll draw near to us. We'll resist the devil. Now the devil, the virus, the great plague, uh, has, doesn't have the appeal that it once did because now the Holy Spirit is working in with us, all right? And then James just breaks away into this terminology, wash your hands. Well, this actually, this term really doesn't refer to a physical washing. Now, we want you to sanitize. All right, we want you to wear gloves if you need to. We want you to spray everything down with Clorox in your house. We want you to take extra caution. All right, so we want you to do that, but that's not what James is talking about. He says, wash your hands. It's something greater, far deeper. And he's actually referring, again, to a Jewish practice of purification. Now, I want us to take us to Mark, the seventh chapter, real quick. We've got to move along because uh, I know you want to eat breakfast and you've got some things you want to do. And so, uh, but just listen carefully now, because I want you to understand the history of this term that James is using when he says, wash your hands. And he's actually alluding here to a custom. Mark the 7th chapter, verse 3. The Pharisees, Mark 7, verse 3, and the Jews did not eat unless they carefully washed their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. So it was a ceremony. It was a ceremonial cleansing. It had absolutely nothing to do with, hey, you better wash your hands before you eat because you don't want to get sick. You know, how we tell our kids to do it all the time. They come in from playing, hey, go wash your hands before you, uh, you sit down to dinner. I remember as a kid, I remember as a kid, my dad just tells us, now when you go to the bathroom, don't open the door with your, uh, with your hand, open it with your jacket or with a towel. I mean, we learned this as kids. I remember when restaurants allowed you to go get refills, my dad said, now to be careful, don't put your glass up on that little metal thing because everybody else has put their glass with their lips on that. Always put your finger there. He said, he was way ahead. He was way ahead of where we are now. Uh, so it, he, Jesus is not suggesting that you eat with filthy hands. Okay? He's, all right? He, he practiced good hygiene. I mean, the children of Israel had to practice good hygiene in, in the wilderness. They wouldn't have survived. God was all about that. Read the Pentateuch. You realize, man, God was serious about being clean, and, and, and hygiene was a priority in the Old Testament. So Jesus is not advocating that we eat purposely with filthy hands. But he's attacking this false ceremony, this ceremony that had gotten totally out of control, again, by the Pharisees. All right, skip down to verse 5. So the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, hey, why do your disciples, why do your followers not walk according to the tradition of the elders and eat their bread with impure hands? And Jesus knew, again, that this religious elite had, and this tradition practice had nothing to do with genuine cleansing, but it was just an empty ritual. So he looks at them, and he quotes a passage of Scripture from the Old Testament. He said, didn't Isaiah the prophet, didn't he just peg you guys in verse 6? You honor me with your lips, but your heart, your heart is far from me. That which really needs cleansing gets no attention, your heart. Now, I know there's some people watching right now who are taking every precaution not to get COVID-19. Congratulations. 
I've had folks who said, Jim, I, I just hope when the church opens up, you guys are thinking of everything because we don't want to give it or, or receive it. Listen, we're doing everything humanly possible. And I said this last week, I'm going to say it again, I'm not trying to be morbid or sarcastic, but if you want to go to a world where there is absolutely no virus, where the sounds of a siren and an ambulance will never be heard, where there are no more hospitals or funerals or cemeteries, there's only one place to go to get there, and that's called heaven, and the catch is you've got to die to get there. But as long as we're here, we're going to take every precaution we can to extend life as long as we can, and to enjoy each other's company and the opportunities to advance the kingdom every day. All right? So please note that. But when Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, you know, you've got this ceremonial hand cleansing things down to a science. The problem is you've neglected your heart. My concern is there are many Christians and professed believers today all around the world that are taking every precaution they can not to get COVID-19 or the flu or typhoid or whatever else and have spent very little time examining their heart. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to back up just a little bit. And we're going to ask the great physician to come in. We're going to draw near to him so he'll draw near to us. We're going to get close to God. We're going to let him examine and x-ray our heart, x-ray our mind, x-ray our speech practice some spiritual sanctification. Verse 14, after he called the multitude to him again, he begins saying to them, listen to me all of you and understand this. And verse 15 I think is the crux of this passage here in Mark in regards to washing your hands and what it really really means in the days of Jesus and when James refers to it here in the fourth chapter, verse 8. There is nothing outside the man which going into him can defile him, but the things which proceed out of the mouth, those things which proceed out of the man is what defiles him. Verse 20, that which proceeds out of the man, which is what defiles the man, from, from, for, from within, out of the heart of men, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts and fornication and thefts and murders and adultery. The term fornication in the New Testament means any kind of illicit sexual activity. And you say, well, what is that? The sexual immorality in the Scriptures, and I've said this before, but audience, please listen. I didn't write this. you got a problem, take it up with the great physician, not me. I didn't write it. But fornication and sexual immorality is referred to any kind of sexual activity outside of a monogamous relationship between a man and a woman in marriage. And so while we're all worried about touching something that isn't clean or breathing someone's bad breath or potential virus, while we're spraying down everything so we don't get bacteria or the flu or COVID, Jesus is saying, look, you're so worried about the physical, you've neglected the spiritual. He said, it's what proceeds out of you and from your heart that should take precedent over the physical washing of one's hand, this phony baloney ceremony that the Pharisees were forcing and demanding and making compulsory for everybody. Deeds of coveting, verse 22, and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, unrestrained, shameless behavior. All of these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Here's my point. Let's put one of these over our heart. And I know why we wear these, so we don't give something to someone or get something from someone. But do you realize how many Christians right now need to pray, God, help me put a muffler. Help me, help me put one of these face masks over my mouth so the lies, the hatred, the vitriol, the foul language, that all needs to stop. As concerned as we are about catching a germ from someone, Jesus says here in Mark 7, look, I, I just need you to make sure you're guarding your heart. You guard your hearts. That leads me to my final point here, James 4, 8. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Purify your hearts. Back in the Old Testament, they worshipped in a, in a tent called a tabernacle, and I've alluded to this before. 
We're not going to read Exodus 30, 19 through 21 because we don't have time, but you can read it later this week. There was a tent, and in that tent was the holy place, and then in the other half was the holy of holies. But in the outer courtyard were two uh, pieces of furniture, if you will. One was a basin of water, and the other was an altar of sacrifice. And God said to Aaron and to his sons, before you make a physical sacrifice, an animal sacrifice, you need to wash your hands and you need to wash your feet. That was God's way of saying, look, I want you to be cleansed. I want you to to send a message to the people as priests. I need to see purity in your lifestyle and in the hearts as you approach me in worship. 1 Peter 3.21, the like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. When people are baptized, it's not like, well, Jim, I got dirty fingernails, I need to get baptized. Jim, my feet smell, I need to get baptized. That's nothing to do with the physical cleansing. The like figure, wherein to baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. It's not the water that saves, but the water is emblematic of what? The blood of Christ that does. And so the priest would wash their hands in that basin of water and then make their way over to that altar and prepare for sacrifice. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, verses 1 and 12, Dear friends, he's writing to the church, let's purify ourselves, let's wash our hands spiritually from everything that contaminates body and spirit. Let's start perfecting holiness. That means let's make our holiness complete out of reverence and respect for God. And so again, church family, I want us to take precautions. We're going to have these all over the sanctuary. We're going to treat communion different. We're going to have it. We're going to let people come up and receive it themselves so you don't have to touch other people's cup and touch the bread. You can have it yourself. Go back to your seat, meditate, contemplate. Again, we're taking all kinds of measures. Phase two, we'll introduce the children's program again. But right now, the nursery will be open for for infants, for moms, and three- and four-year-olds can use the chapel. But the reality is everybody else needs to be here. Why? Because we just need to practice this kind of distancing that we, that the, the, Governments ask us to do as we re-enter corporate worship. But I also want you to be thinking while you're re-entering physically, I want you to be re-entering spiritually. Listen carefully now. Again, dear friends, let's begin to purify ourselves from everything, every sin, every evil thought, every word that contaminates body and spirit. And in that we perfect holiness. Therefore, Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. You talk about social distancing. Paul says, listen, the secular world is going to bring you down. You've got church to come out. Now, we don't want to lose our witness. He's not promoting isolationism. He's simply saying, look, stop modeling the world. Stop modeling the carnal behavior of a fallen sick society. Come out, church, from among them. Be separate, saith the Lord and touch no unclean thing. Now, in biblical days, an unclean thing could have been a dead body. Don't touch someone with leprosy. You're talking about the incurable virus, leprosy. So he says, look, these are the things you don't need to touch. A festering wound, don't touch. So they understood in biblical days when he said, don't touch things that are unclean. But in Paul's writings to the church at Corinth, that which is unclean is sin. So let me ask a question right now. In our efforts to stay pure, in our efforts to stay healthy, as we sanitize and put on our mask and spray everything down, are we too thinking of ways that we can become more spiritually purified? Lord, my language, the stuff I've been saying for years, the temper that's totally out of control, God, the, the websites that I go to, I, I haven't paid any attention through this whole coronavirus and this whole quarantine. I, I haven't thought about the inner man. I'm so concerned about not getting COVID or getting a physical virus or a physical illness that I fail to recognize that I'm, di- I'm dying spiritually. As concerned and overwhelmed with staying physically clean and healthy, Church, we have to consecrate ourselves today to maintain spiritual cleanliness, spiritual purity. There's a lot of talk about the number of people that have died of COVID-19 every day. It's all over the news. Do you know that every day in the United States of America, just under 3,000 children will see their parents get divorced in America? 
How much air time does that get? You know that 1,800 children every day in the United States of America, and some of this material is a little dated, 1,800 children are abused or neglected in America every day. Every day. Now that's a virus. That's a spiritual sin. That needs to be addressed. We hear nothing of it. Every day in the United States of America, six teenagers will commit suicide, will take their lives in the prime of their lives because they see no future, they see no hope. In their world, COVID virus doesn't even come close to the spiritual vacuum within their life because they were never taught to draw near to God so he could draw near to them. In the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, 3,000 babies are aborted, out of, mostly out of convenience, in the United States of America every day. And some of the same politicians that are all over the television screen and the same this media of mass deception that is making uh, 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 enormous, giving so much attention to COVID-19 are saying nothing of the innocent children that are being aborted in this country every day. That's a virus that needs to be addressed. And the irony is some of these very congressmen are running for re-election in this country. The United States of America, wake up and recognize COVID-19 is not the only virus. There's a sin crisis in this country that needs to be addressed. And church... It's our job. It's our obligation, spiritual obligation, to be the next Elijah and to call for revival. And I'm telling you, if we will, he'll bring it. He'll bring it. 27 children will die from poverty every day in the United States of America. 623 teenagers will be getting a sexually transmitted disease before this day is over in the United States of America. Approximately 1.1 million people in the United States are living with HIV or AIDS today. And not every one of them received it through sexual impropriety. But the reality is when we begin to treat sex in a way that does not glorify and honor and hold up the principles found within the source of all truth, which is the scriptures, these are the epidemics and the crisis and the issues that we deal with. And I don't say this out of hate. What I'm simply saying is this. Long after COVID-19 has come and gone and we've reentered the workforce and the economy makes recovery and people go back to living what is called a quote-unquote normal life, these are some of the same viruses and sin crises and issues the church will still need to deal with, but we can't deal with it if we're not in tune with what's going on in our world. And realize there's only one physician that can take care of it. And that's the God of the universe. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to help purify our hearts, to purify our thoughts, to purify our lifestyle, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Man, isn't that great? That's powerful. Embrace that. Wash your hands? Yeah. Wear a mask and gloves? Why not? Practice people distancing? Yeah. Self-quarantine? We've been doing that. But there's more. There's the purification of the heart that needs to take place as well. And I pray today, I passionately pray for you, and I want you to pray for me, that through this quarantine and through this virus, that there's been an awakening, a spiritual awakening within God's people, not just in Kissimmee, but around the world, in our colleges, in our Christian schools, in our churches, in our parachurch organizations. I close with this. Ravi Zacharias had a huge impact on my life and my ministry. I quote from him frequently. I, I didn't agree with every theological stance he took, but I will tell you, for the most part, he was one of the great leading apologists in the United States and around the world. And I close our message this morning with these words. He said, how do we answer the questions revolving around the subjects of morality and relationships and religion, the purpose of life, the sanctity of marriage and inner peace? Because these are the questions that everybody's asking, whether you're a believer or not. And all of these are unanswerable coherently from a naturalist point of view. And a naturalist is someone that does not embrace the transcendent truths of God in his world. So he says, unless there is a place for humanity, a a set of transcendent truths, and an all-knowing God who brings coherency and clarity to these questions, disbelief in God and His Word fails to even justify the question. 
I believe there's a God. I believe He wants a relationship with you. And I know He wants a relationship with me. He wants me to come near Him. He wants me to learn to resist evil and pursue good. He wants me to wash my hands, not physically, but but prepare my hands for works of service. And that happens when my hands are washed and I have a clean heart. When I do that, I'm in a position to serve Him regardless of the climate of our secular society. So as we continue to function in this world, the threat of virus, sickness, plagues, let's remember to not just sanitize, but let's be sanctified as well. As we move into our time together around the Lord's table in our spaces, in our living rooms, wherever we have, and as we get ready to celebrate that meal together, I start, we'd start it this way just by uh, just thinking about the hope that we have, and more than that, the good news that we have that it brings with it. Uh, this past week, my family and I, we got some good news. Now, what's the good news, you ask? Good question, good question. Enrico Diaz, special friend of the family. Uh, I was a youth minister I worked with back in the day. has really impacted my daughters and their life. That guy, Enrico Diaz, is getting a kidney. Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, he's getting a kidney, and you're like... Okay, I'm excited. No, no, we're excited. We're excited. This guy has dealt with degenerative kidney disease for, for a long time and fought it with diet and then dialysis, and now that time is coming to an end. Hope on the horizon, right? It's there for him. It's good news, and uh, we almost can't stand it, right? It's so good. It's so good. Uh, but, but also along with that good news is this good thought. That he's getting that kidney not because of some accident, uh, not because someone was forced to give it up. He's getting that kidney because someone cared enough about him to give what was precious to them, right? Someone cared about him enough that they're going to give. It's because of love. And that's significant. That's significant. We walk into this time of communion, and I get the connection. I get the connection there. What, what we call good news, the Bible calls gospel, means the same thing. And what does it look like? Uh, Jesus put it this way, Luke chapter 22, the night before he's betrayed, he's there with his disciples participating in what we're about to. And here's what he says. Luke 22, verse 19, he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them. I gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. He gave, he poured out so that we could have life. That's the good news that we get to celebrate together today as we partake in the Lord's Supper. So let's Let's sing and then let's move toward that time together. Yeah. 
Father God, thank you. Thank you for the sacrifice that brings us life. Thank you that you loved us enough that you gave your son. Uh, thank you that, that you cared for us and gave what we needed so that we could have life. God, we celebrate that now uh, in our homes, in our spaces, and we lift our hearts to you. We lift our eyes to you. Uh, we move toward you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Church family, we hope that you've been encouraged by our time together this morning through our worship, through the time we spent uh, in God's Word, through the time we spent sharing in communion. Uh, and I want to thank Professor Rory Christensen and his family for helping lead us in worship today. I'm so thankful for who they are, their commitment to Johnson University, and their commitment to this church family. They help make us better. So I'm so thankful that they were willing to give of their time and their talent uh, to help lead us in worship today. Um, they help make us better. Remember, church family, go on the website. Next Sunday is going to be our regathering, and we don't want you to miss any of that. Uh, you can go on our website and register for the services, 815, 930, or 11 in the morning, and then the 5 in the afternoon. Um, so you can register, you can, you can see what's going on, all the different things that are happening. Um, and know that this is phase one, so phase two hopefully will be coming sooner rather than later. Uh, but we're just so excited about being together. So uh, we're going to end today by singing a little bit of King of Glory.
Take care, church family. God bless. Be safe.